All right, this will be class number nine. By now you should have taken your quiz from the previous class, and we'll take up where we left off. In our, um, what we're covering is what's on seminar part four of my series. And the last couple weeks we talked about, or last class we talked about survival of the fittest. It really doesn't happen. It's actually survival of the luckiest. So let's take up with uh, just an illustration to help you see how that some people can make good observations and still come to the wrong conclusions. Maybe you heard the story about the scientists who were going to see how far the frog could jump. They put this big old frog down, and they said, jump, frog! That big old bullfrog jumped 80 inches. They brought the frog back to the starting line and cut off one leg. Said, jump, frog! He only jumped 70 inches. They brought him back, cut off another leg. Said, jump, frog! He only jumped 60 inches. They brought him back, cut off another leg. Said, jump, frog! He only jumped 50 inches. They brought him back, cut off his last leg, and said, jump, frog. You know, they expected he'd go about 40 inches. He actually jumped zero. The frog didn't move. They were amazed. They tried the experiment again. That new frog got the same results. They yelled and screamed and coaxed and said, come on, jump, frog, jump. Frog didn't move. So these brilliant scientists looked at their graph, and they were just confused. How could this happen? So they concluded the frog jumped less as the legs were removed. Now, that's a good observation. That's true. Then they said, see, what we proved is that a frog with no legs goes deaf. No, <laughs> bad conclusion. <laughs> good observation, bad conclusion. And many people are guilty of this. They make good observations and come to the wrong conclusion. For instance, they did their experiment with the fruit flies. They got these poor flies, and they nuked them and microwaved them and x-rayed them and radiated them and everything else. And they got mutated babies, of course. Some of the flies were born with uh, uh, curled wings. They fly around, couldn't go anywhere. They got flies with uh, no wings. What do you call that? A crawl? You can't fly. So... They raised all these flies in the laboratory and got all sorts of mutated flies, but they still got a fly. And here, just recently in the newspaper, they said, uh, Darwin is as fit as ever. Here we see evolution in action. Right here, two flies. This is the proof for evolution. One fly has wings that are a little bit bigger than the other fly. Is that proof for evolution? <laughs> Wait a minute. It's still a fly. You might have a fly getting better nutrition and able to grow bigger, or, you know, he's in an area where the larger wingspan is necessary for some reason. Maybe he's in higher altitude and he needs, you know, bigger wing because the air is thinner. I don't know, but it's still a fly. That's an example of variation within the kind. That would be an example of microevolution. But some poor student's going to read this and think, wow, they have proof for evolution. I saw it in the paper. No, they have proof for variations after their kind. The scientists concluded that all the mutations observed with the fruit flies produced flies that were inferior to the original fly. That's a good observation. And then they said, you know, this proves that flies have evolved as far as they can go. No, that's a bad conclusion. Jump, frog, jump. <laughs> yes, all the mutants you got were inferior to the original grandpa fly. Maybe that proves that God made the flies right to begin with. It doesn't prove they've evolved as far as they can go. It, they were already fine before you started messing with them. That's what it proves. Then they did the thing with the peppered moth. Now, this was, this was hilarious. They counted the moths on the trees. So the story goes. It must have been a government project go around counting the moths on the trees. They discovered it was 95% light-colored moths and 5% black. Now, these are two colors of the exact same species of moth. Biston betulia, whatever it is. Better, Biston betularia. I didn't take Latin, I took French. It took me further than I took it. But uh, There's two colors of the same kind of moth. Most of them were light-colored because the trees were light-colored and they blended in. The birds are more likely to see a dark moth on a light tree, so they would be easier to find to eat. That's how the story goes. Then, when they began burning coal in the factories in England back in the Industrial Revolution, 
they got all this coal coming out, turning the trees black around the factories. So they counted the moths again around the factories and found out it was 95% black moths and 5% light. And they said, see, evolution. The white moth evolved into a black moth. No, that's not what happened at all. Now, it turns out the whole story is a fake. It didn't happen at all. But even if it were true, the ratio of the population shifted. The moth didn't change. It started off as a moth. It ended up as a moth. Yep, that proves we all came from a rock, all right? I mean, what more evidence could you possibly need? <laughs> I don't see how. They don't see how dumb that is. Turns out, after 40 years of watching the trees, two moths were found on the tree trunks in 40 years. So what the guy did to take the picture to go in your textbook, he glued dead moths to the trees and took the picture as proof for evolution. They were dead and glued on the tree. Then he took a dead bird and stuffed it and glued it on the tree like it's about to eat the colored moth that he wanted it to eat. The whole thing was staged. It was fake. didn't happen. But even if it would have happened, what would they have proven? Well, let's see. The moth population ratio shifted from mostly white to mostly black. Okay? That would have been true. Moth population was able to adapt to the new environment. Okay? That would have been a good observation also. This helps prove we all came from a rock. Oh, no. Now, there's a bad conclusion. Okay? Jump, frog, jump. Uh, what you would have concluded is that God made the moth with the ability to produce a variety of babies. Some dark, some light, so some, they're always, some of them are going to survive no matter what happens to the background. That's proof for creation. Then they tell the students to get a large sheet of black paper, one meter square. I like to kick this dog every time I walk by. All the new textbooks that I'm aware of are metric. I understand the metric system very thoroughly. I taught physics. I'll take a metric quiz against anybody you know. But I'm not sure I want a kid coming to help build my house that doesn't know what a 2x4 is. Okay, so if you're a patriot, make your paper 39.37 inches instead. And then it says get 200 white circles and 200 black circles and cut them out and throw them on the paper. And then they say, okay, boys and girls, we're going to see how many you can pick up in one minute. Go. Well, of course, you're going to pick up the white circles off the black paper. You don't need to be a genius to figure this out. And they're going to say, see, this proves evolution. No, teacher, this proves we got extra money to waste in our school district. We just cut up a whole bunch of good paper and threw it on the floor. Now we got to pay the janitor to pick up the ones we couldn't find. That's not proof for evolution. It's proof the Creator was pretty smart. He put this ability in these moths to produce a variety of colors of babies, so some will always survive. The peppered moth is actually excellent proof of design. See, God wants to make sure some survive no matter what happens. And yet they give the kids the idea that this is evidence for evolution. Actually, it's called planning ahead. Did you know General Motors and Ford and, I believe, Toyota puts a heater and an air conditioner in some of their cars? Now, wait a minute. Doesn't a heater and an air conditioner do the opposite thing? One heats it up, one cools it down. Why would you put both in the same car? Well, because they don't know if it's going to go to hot climate or cold climate, right? It's planning ahead for General Motors to put both of them in the car. And it's planning ahead for God to put both genes in the moth population. So if it lands in an area where dark survives better, okay, then the dark ones survive. If it lands in an area where light ones survive, then the light ones survive. That's not evolution. That's planning ahead. Now look at this sentence carefully. This textbook uh, right here. Cult biology is absolutely loaded with evolution propaganda. They tell the kids, we're going to learn to think critically. Now look at this sentence carefully. This is the book used at, you go to uh, Woodham. Woodham uses this book. Okay? They tell the kids, think critically. Do you think humans are still evolving? Now what kind of question is that? That's one of those questions like, have you stopped beating your wife yet? Oh, wait a minute. If I say yes, I'm admitting I did. If I say no, then I'm still doing it. 
That type of question cannot be answered with a yes or no. The question assumes you were beating your wife, right? So the question says, have you stopped beating your wife yet? Well, what if you never did? How can you answer this question? Go back and look at the question they asked the kids in high school. Do you think humans are still evolving? Doesn't that question assume that evolution happened? What if a kid doesn't believe in evolution at all? How is he supposed to answer that question? Look at the next one. How might the dinosaurs' body heat problems have led to their extinction? There are two assumptions in this question. Who can see them? They're assuming dinosaurs are extinct, right? And they're assuming they have body heat problems. So by the time they get to the question, now the kid's got to answer this for some, you know, homework. How's he supposed to answer that? These kind of questions are not teaching the students how to think. They are teaching them what to think. These kind of questions are used in Soviet schools for indoctrination. Do you think communism is uh, uh, a great form of government? <laughs> questions that the question is phrased to get the get the answer that they want. Most of the surveys they do for these political things in election years, they phrase the question a certain way to get the answer that they want to make the poll look like you know everybody's for their candidate. And I, I don't I would I wouldn't trust the polls at all. I don't care what the polls say. I'm going to vote for the best guy I think is the best guy. And if he has a zero chance of winning, okay. My job is to do what's right. And if it hair lips the devil, well, well tough, okay. I'm going to do what's right. If nobody likes it, okay. I'm, i got to stand before God and say, God, I did what was right. I'm not going to vote for some guy because he has the best chance of winning. You vote, you do what's right. Period, okay. This uh, chapter in Heath Biology, I don't know if I got that one here with me. Probably. Got a bunch more on the floor. Anyway, I got thousands of textbooks. Well, hundreds of textbooks. This one says, we have evidence of evolution from structure. Now, watch this carefully. This is called the homology argument. And this is one you need to know for the quiz. Homology, homo means the same, and ology is the study of. Geology, study of geo, earth. Biology, study of bio, life. The biosphere is the living part of the world. Uh, homology is the study of things that are the same. So they're going to say structures of different animals are the same and therefore they must have evolved. They will show you four limbs or front arms called the four limb of different animals and they'll say the human has a humerus, a radius, and ulna. Okay? And then you have the carpals and phalanges and, you know, the fingers. Um, they're going to say, see, boys and girls, the cat has the same design. And so does the whale. He has a radius and an ulna. Oh, well, who named him? The whale? You know, who decided to call these bones this? <laughs> I'm sure the whale didn't decide that. They show the students examples of different animals and say they have a similar forelimb structure, which is true. I agree. But look what they say here now. Notice first the overall similarity, then the difference in details. What you are doing is what scientists do in comparative anatomy, the study of the structure of different organisms. Comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. Different kinds of organisms, such as a bird, a horse, or human, share similar structures. That's true. As you have just observed, each animal in figure 12-3 has a four-limb structure that is a variation of a common pattern. I agree. I, I'm with them so far. I agree. The commonality suggests that these and all other vertebrate animals are all related. Oh, now right there, they just lost me. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. Oh, now they really lost me. What's another explanation? That Why would you say all these animals have similar four-limb structures? They have a common designer. Doesn't prove a common ancestor. Couldn't it be a common designer? Did you know the Honda Accord and the Honda Civic and the Honda Prelude have thousands of parts that are interchangeable? 
they all evolved from a skateboard. I mean, that's proof, right? <laughs> oh, no, they have the same guys designing them. That's what it proves. And how they get by with telling the students that this is evidence for evolution blows my mind. This is just as much evidence for a common designer. But the students are never told that. These books only show one possible explanation. It is true there are similar forelimb structures on many animals. This is true. Now, what does that prove? They're going to tell you it proves evolution. No, it's evidence for design. It's evidence for creator. you got to admit, it works pretty good. I mean, the wrist and the hand and the arm, this is an amazing structure, what it can do. If you could invent a machine that could do what your arm can do, you would be a multi-gazillionaire. Nobody's been able to make a machine that is as efficient as your arm. It's unbelievable. All the different motions it can make, incredible. The dexterity, it's design. But they're going to say, boys and girls, many animals have a similar forelimb structure. I agree. They must have had a common ancestor. Oh, eh, I disagree. This helps prove we came from a rock. Oh, now I really disagree. <laughs> it doesn't prove any such thing. Poor students, though. I mean, what's a freshman kid supposed to do in high school? The teacher says this is evidence for evolution. The book says it's evidence for evolution. He's going to believe it. He's going to be tested on it. It's just unfair. That's not an education. That's being indoctrinated. This textbook says we have evidence from development. Well, there aren't too many things about this whole theory that make me any angrier than this. So I'm going to try to stay calm while I explain it to you. This uh, BSCS, Biological Science, by the way, let me stop right here and say the BSCS series of textbooks, there's several different publishers. This is Holt, this is Harcourt, uh, Harcourt, Brace, Jovanovich, HBJ, they usually abbreviate it. Here's uh, Prentice Hall, many different publishers of textbooks. They just want one thing, money. They're trying to sell their books, okay? And so they will put in there whatever the people are buying. And if we get some intelligent folks on the textbook selection committee to say, look, your book teaches evolution. We don't want that in there. I mean, let's suppose you were the chief executive officer, officer the CEO at Holt Reinhardt Winston. And you started getting letters from all across the country from people on school boards and said, look, we did not buy your book this year because you have too much evolution in it. Well, what are you going to do next year? You take it out. But see, the Christians are busy going to church and singing praises, and we should be, okay? But the humanists, there aren't very many of them. Six to ten percent of the population is atheistic, that's all. But they're busy sending letters and lobbying government officials and sending letters to textbook publishers saying, we want more evolution in the textbooks. They'll spend their time getting on the committee to select the books that all of the kids in our county have to use. And I've gone down to the school board meetings many times and gone to textbook selection committee meetings. And it's tragic to see the high number of evolutionists, very unproportional to the population. But they're on the committee to select the books that all of the kids in the county have to use. Anyway, BSCS is one of the worst there is as far as teaching evolution. If you have an opportunity to choose between books, that would be the last one I would choose. Anything published by... Uh, the BSCS Corporation. Okay. This was clear back in 1978. But look what this book says. The similarity between early stages in the development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. This is called the uh, embryology argument for evolution. Here's uh, Merrill Earth Science, 93 edition. They show the little folds of skin under the chin of this embryo, a baby developing inside the mother. And then it says it has gill pouches. Now hold it. Are those gills? You know, a fish has gills so he can breathe in the water. Those are not gills. If you want to memorize how evolution supposedly happened, just look at the, right there on the word farm. F-A-R-M. It's an acrostic. Fish, amphibian, Reptiles, mammals. They say fish evolved first and then slowly became amphibian. Amphibian means it has two lives. It lives in the water part of its life and then it lives on land part of its life. Okay. Then fish, amphibian, reptiles, lizards, etc. 
And then finally, they turned into birds and mammals. So just the word farm, F-A-R-M, will be, help you memorize the order of how evolution supposedly happened. So here they're saying the human embryo has gills like a fish. What they're going to teach here, this embryology argument, you can see the word there, embryology, the study of embryos. Um, they're going to say that the embryo in the mother goes through those four stages before it becomes a human. So when it first starts to grow, it's actually in the fish stage with gills. Those are not gills, okay? This whole thing is a lie. Those little folds of skin actually develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. They are not gills. They're not even vestigial gills. They're just a little fold of skin. That's all they are. I've seen fat people that have five or six chins. They cannot breathe through any of them except the top one. Okay, Those are not gills. <laughs> They're just folds of skin, that's all. What happened back in 1860? This man, Ernst Haeckel, you need to know his name, write this down, Ernst Haeckel, he was an embryology professor. He taught at the university in Germany, a university called the University of Jena, J-E-N-A. Ernst Haeckel was an embryology professor. Students would take his class and they would study embryos of different animals. You cut open the fish and take out the you know, undeveloped fish eggs, you know, and then you cut, look at them under the microscope, and you study the different animals in the embryonic stage to see how they develop. A very fascinating study, by the way. Ernst Haeckel taught this stuff at the University of Jena. Then in 1860, he read this book, Charles Darwin's book. This book came out in 1859. Now, in 1859, Russia was still controlled by a czar, 1850s, 1860s. Yeah, up until 1917. You know who the czar was in 18... doesn't matter. 59, I wouldn't know. But uh, during the 1850s, slavery was still going on here in America. When did the Civil War start? One, 1861. So in 1859, when this book came out, we still had slavery. The title to the book is The Origin of Species, but there's more to it. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. See, Darwin was a racist. We'll get into more of that later. He thought there are favored races. One race must be better than the others. And Ernst Haeckel read this book. Now, Ernst Haeckel was in Germany. Guess what happened to the Germans over the next 70 years? They became what they thought was the master race. And this book had a very profound influence on the rise of Adolf Hitler. He thought the blonde hair, blue-eyed Norwegians and Germans were superior. They were the Aryan race. And this book started all that thinking. 1860, Ernst Haeckel read this book, and it changed his whole philosophy of life. Darwin predicted in his book that they would find evidence for his theory. All he did was come up with a theory. He said, I think all life forms have a common ancestor. Well, where's the evidence? There was none. After nine years, Ernst Haeckel started getting worried. You know, I, I like this theory, I like evolution, but... Uh, I don't see any evidence. I think I'll make some. Ernst Haeckel took a picture, or took a drawing, of a human and a dog embryo. This is four weeks after conception. He changed the drawings and made them look very similar. Here are his fake drawings. He lied. He enlarged the head on the dog, and he decreased the size of the head on the human, he changed the eye details. He changed all sorts of things. Notice how similar they look. I'll back up one and show you. There's the actual drawings. If you take time to look at the actual drawings, the right ones, compared to his, you'll notice all sorts of changes. There they are, one on top of the other. He lied, basically. Ernst Haeckel actually did this with quite a few different animals. 
he made the drawing of a human, of a salamander, of a fish. Look how the very top row here, all of them look very similar, don't they? He made a gigantic poster of this drawing and traveled all over Germany and held seminars on evolution to prove the evolution theory. Because remember, Darwin's book came out 1859. He read it in 1860. 1869, he started traveling and speaking on evolution to try to promote the theory. We ought to believe in this theory because here's the proof. Poof, up comes this big chart. See, look at that. All the animals are similar in the embryonic stage. And he said that proves that the human starts off as a fish. And then it becomes an amphibian. Then it becomes a reptile. And finally becomes a human and it's born after nine months. Well, now, hold on just a minute. This uh, professor from St. George, uh, Richardson from St. George Hospital uh, Medical School in London said just a couple years ago, a set of 19th century drawings, that's Ernst Haeckel's, that still appear in reference books are badly misdrawn, says an embryologist in Britain. Although Haeckel confessed to drawing from memory and was convicted of fraud at the University of Jena. Well, that's interesting. That's where he taught. If I understand the details on the story, I may have some of the minor details uh, confused here, but I believe six professors accused Haeckel of faking these drawings, so they held a trial at the University of Jena. Professor Haeckel was on trial. He was convicted of fraud. They said, Ernst, you lied. In 1874, Ernst Haeckel was convicted of fraud. I write that date down, 1874. In 1874, the idea that the human embryo has gills was proven false. He came up with this idea in 1869. So for five years, people are teaching this. On top are Haeckel's drawings. On the bottom are actual photographs taken by Richardson of the same animal. Now, either Haeckel is an extremely lousy artist, or he's a liar. His drawings on top, he said, that's what the turtle looks like in the embryonic stage. I don't think so, Ernest. I mean, have you ever seen a turtle in the embryonic stage? What about the salamander? I'd say he's nowhere close, right? He just flat lied. That's all there is to it. So this was proven in 1874. It was proven that Ernst Haeckel had lied. He was, his own university convicted him of fraud. But guess what? Haeckel's exact same chart is used this year at the University of West Florida in Pensacola as evidence for evolution. It was proven wrong 125 years ago. Why would this still be in a university textbook? Guess what? The book used at your school on page 183 is still teaching the same thing Proven wrong 125 years ago. Guess what? Glencoe Biology. I've got it in my office there. Still teaches the human embryo has gill pouches. Proven wrong in 1874. Here's a, a biology textbook used in the Troy State University. A college textbook. Still teaching them. Human embryo has gill pouches. Biology, A Journey into Life, Arms in Camp, a terrible book as far as, I mean, loaded with evolution propaganda. Look at this, look at this. Says. It shows them a picture of a five to six week human embryo. But look what it says at the top. By seven months, the fetus looks from the outside like a tiny normal baby. But it is not. What are they trying to say here? It's not a baby at seven months. Well, what is it? Seven months developed? You know, a whole bunch of kids born at five and a half months survive. My son back there running the camera was born at, I think, seven months and survived. Kind of small, but he made it. And he caught up for the size, but uh, he, he made it. If kids born five and a half months old survive, 34% of them. Um, there's a 21-week-old baby 
They were doing surgery. They knew something was wrong with the baby. So inside the mother, they cut the mother open, cut the uterus open to do surgery on the baby. Baby's only five months along in development. The baby reaches out and grabs the doctor's finger. <laughs> Tell me it's not alive. Okay? The angel of the Lord said, Behold, thou art with fetus. Now, is that what they said? I believe he said you are with child, right? See, they want to call it a fetus because it doesn't sound like a child. It's a child the instant it's conceived. It's a human. Life begins at conception. Every doctor knows that that knows anything. Why do they keep this lie in the textbooks? I mean, it's been proven wrong 125 years ago. Why do they want you to learn this when you take biology class? What would be the logic for keeping this lie in these textbooks? There's only one reason. Justify abortion. They don't want you to think it's a human yet. You're just killing a fish. You're just killing an amphibian, just a reptile. No, it's a human. See, the Lord uh, told the devil after he tricked Eve, you're going to crawl on your belly and eat dust the rest of your life. And he said, I'm going to, this, this, some seed of the woman is going to bruise your head. We went through all this before. How that Satan really wants to reduce the population of the world. He wants to destroy humanity. And we'll skip over all this part. You can get videotape number one for more on that. About Satan's goal to destroy the world, to, dis to just to eliminate humans. And one of the ways to do it is by abortion. Here's a little Anna Rosa. She had her arm chopped off in a botched abortion. There are several different ways they abort the babies. One is they just inject salt solution right into the uterus, just a needle right through the outside, and, and the baby is burned by the salt. And the baby thrashes around in there and finally dies and then is re rejected by the body. Others, they, they cut the baby apart in little pieces and pull them out piece by piece. That's what they were doing with Anna Rosa. The mother was seven and a half months pregnant. Baby could have been born and survived. Cut the arm off, pulled the arm out and said, oh, well, it'll die. Well, she didn't. She survived. As far as I know, still alive today. Missing an arm. Everybody says, oh, that's terrible. Oh, I agree. What if they would have cut her head off instead? We never would have heard of Anna Rosa, would we? Do you know 4,500 babies were killed today? 4,500 more are going to be killed tomorrow. Legal abortion in America. That's just America. Wait till you see what's going on in the rest of the world. Now, here in Pensacola, Florida, we've had two abortion doctors shot and killed, several clinics blown up or burned down. I didn't blow any clinics up, and I didn't shoot any doctors, okay? And I don't think Jesus would do it that way either. He grew up under Roman control. He didn't go around, you know, blowing up bridges and <laughs> blowing up tanks and stuff like that. But the doctors were murderers, plain and simple. There's just no nice way to say it. They were murdering kids. And anybody that commits an abortion is committing murder. Well, I was flying back from Fort Lauderdale one time. I was preaching down there in Fort Lauderdale. I was flying home. The day, the, while I was down there in Fort Lauderdale, one of the doctors was shot and killed, Dr. Gunn. This guy killed him. Well, the next day, I was flying up to Pensacola. Right in front of me on the airplane were two ladies, forget that, two women, from NOW, National Organization for Wild Women. They were coming up to Pensacola, and they were going to march around town, hold up their signs, you know, pro-choice, pro-choice. They were going to put on a big demonstration in honor of this great doctor who gave his life for the cause. As we got off the plane, I'm walking down the gangway with these two ladies, uh, women, I mean. I noticed on their shirt they had in huge block letters, Choice Above All. So being my mild-mannered self, I said, Excuse me, ma'am, what does this mean, Choice Above All? She said, We believe a woman ought to have a right to choose. I said, uh, Choose what? She said, choose if she wants to have an abortion. It's her body, you know. I said, well, yes, ma'am. If she wants to abort her body, I suppose that's fine. It looks to me like she wants to abort somebody else's body, though. I said, ma'am, I'm kind of curious about this. I've got three kids. I delivered one at home. I taught biology and anatomy. I used to raise hamsters. Uh, I'm kind of familiar with how this works. I said, tell me, why does the woman's right to choice stop at birth? If that's really what you're worried about is right freedom of choice, you know, choice above all, let's let the mother choose to kill the baby after it's born. It's 
It's a lot easier, a lot safer. It's dangerous to kill the baby while it's inside the mother. No telling how many women have died from, a, from legal abortions. They've got this little long, neat, like a needle with a hook on the end that they will reach in and, and tear pieces of the baby out. The baby's still alive while they're cutting it apart and pulling it out. Well, very frequently they will snag and cut a hole in the large intestine, the bowel. Now you get poisonous substances into the bloodstream and the mother dies. Thousands of women have died from legal abortions. Many thousands more have become sterile. They can never have a child again. Have one abortion and they'll never have a baby in the rest of their life because of a legalized abortion. They don't tell you about that, though. Uh, I said, hey, why don't, you, uh, why don't we kill the baby after it's born? It'd be a lot safer and simpler. I got a brilliant idea. Let's, if it's really a choice you're looking for, let's let the mother choose to kill the baby up until it's two years old. I know a lot of mothers with a two-year-old that have thought about it uh, several times. <laughs> hey, let's extend abortion rights up until the kid is 18. I bet they'd behave a lot better. Look, son, one more time and I'm going to abort you. <laughs> Teacher, where's Johnny today? Well, he didn't do his homework yesterday, so his mommy aborted him. Hey, grades would skyrocket, wouldn't they? <laughs> How can we get so dumb as to believe it's okay to kill the baby? Uh, in the news media and the textbooks always call them pro-choice. Look at this textbook. Pro-choice and anti-abortion demonstrators in Los Angeles. Now, just think about that for a minute. Pro-choice is a nice-sounding word. That's a positive. Pro-choice. Anti-abortion is a negative-sounding word. This sounds bad. Nobody wants to be put in a classification of people who are anti. It's much more positive to say, I am pro-choice. This kind of rhetoric in the news media and in textbooks is all over the place, okay? And it's designed to make the poor kid going to class think, oh, I don't want to be an anti. I'd rather be a pro. It's propaganda is all it is. How about let's call them pro-death and call us pro-life. How would that be for better names? Much better. You got to watch our anti-life and pro-life. How's that? When you get into a discussion on abortion, you got to phrase your words carefully. You know, are you, don't call, don't say, "Are you pro-choice?" Say, "Oh, are you pro-death? Are you anti-life?" You know, do the same thing to them. They're doing to us. Give them a taste of their own medicine. See how they like it. Um, it's always pro-choice, and that's not the issue at all. Well, the news media though always ignores the majority. You can get 100,000 people, and I've seen these demonstrations here in Pensacola where there are thousands of people lining the street with their signs, you know. It's a child, you know, pro-life. You have these pro-life demonstrations here in Pensacola, and you have six people that are for anti-life, that are pro-death, and the news media gives them all the coverage. These six people are going to march around town, and they're going to get all the news media coverage they want because they're coming up here in honor of this doctor who got killed. Now, look, the doctor shouldn't have got shot. Not by gun, anyway, or Paul Hill shot one. Um, they shouldn't have done that. But why, do the, why are they treated like martyrs? Why are the doctors treated like martyrs? They were murderers. I've often asked the question. I've never gotten an answer to it. Maybe you can give me an answer. Think about it. During World War II... A bunch of the Jews were taken away and put in concentration camps. They were guarded. Hitler's soldiers were there guarding these camps. If you had gone in and shot some of the guards and rescued some of the Jews, would you be a good guy or a bad guy? You murdered the guards to save the Jews. If somebody kills a doctor and saves a baby, is he a good guy or bad guy? See, our government has put us into this lousy position of having to make that choice. This is the government's fault. Never should have had to make that choice. Now, I don't think they should have shot the doctors, okay? I think we should legislate this. I think we should put them in jail. I think we should, they should have a fair trial, and then they should be executed. 
Anybody that commits an abortion, any doctor that kills a baby inside the mother is a murderer, and after a fair trial, he should be executed. I feel that strongly about it. And so do a lot of other Americans. The media can't seem to get it right. We get a call every once in a while around here. They say, Mr. Holman, would you like to take the Pensacola News Journal? <laughs> it's hilarious. They transfer the call to me. Mr. Holman, would you like to take the Pensacola News Journal? I say, no, ma'am, we don't have a parakeet. <laughs> she says, what? <laughs> You'll get that about Friday. You know, you put the par newspaper in the bottom of your parakeet cage. <laughs> That's all it's good for, in my opinion. I don't want to support the liberal agenda. Uh, here I was waiting for a taxi to take me home, and these ladies, women, I mean, didn't want to talk about this anymore, pro-choice stuff, after I asked them a few questions. So uh, there's this cameraman. He showed up to film the rally. And I thought, wait a minute, come from Chicago to film this rally, and there's going to be six people? How come when we had a 1,000 people lining the streets, you didn't show up to film that rally? Hmm. 1,000 people against abortion. Where were you guys then? That's why I just can't bring myself to support the liberal media. And I don't care what the news polls say. I'm going to vote for who I think is the best guy. And it doesn't matter at all, whatever the polls say. Um, the, oh, it's always pro-choice. When the kids got shot in Colorado, remember that? Right away, the news media jumped on the gun control issue. I mean, it was all over. What if we should have more gun control? The kids broke 18 gun laws when they went in there and shot everybody. Do you think five more gun laws would have stopped them? They broke 18 already. What's another gun law going to do? Nothing. Well, let's take up that. Uh, we'll take a little break here and cover this section uh, so I can calm down a little bit. And we'll get into more on this uh, news media and abortion, how it ties together right after the break. Okay, let's uh, pick on the news media just a little bit here. When the kids got shot in Colorado, they jumped on the gun control issue right away. They said, we need more gun control. I think when kids keep getting shot in our public schools, it's time to look at a couple of other questions. Number one, should we have public schools? Maybe they should all be shut down and the kids should all go to private schools. That would solve the problem. You don't hear about kids getting shot in private schools very often. <laughs> it's in the public schools. Uh, maybe the question we should consider is, since all these kids are getting shot in the public schools, should we keep teaching them evolution, which says there's no God, there are no standards, there's no absolute, there's no right and wrong? That's what evolution teaches. Maybe instead of gun control, we should discuss the issue of evolution. The kids that did the shooting were strong believers in evolution, by the way. Eric Harris and Dylan Kleibold are the ones that went around and shot everybody. Kleibold's father was a geologist, I suspect. He believed in evolution because most geologists believe the earth is billions of years old. They believe the geologic column, which is a bunch of baloney. We covered that earlier. So I suspect this had a strong influence on Kleibold, on Dylan. Uh, both Eric and Dylan were followers of Nazi teachings. The shooting took place on Hitler's birthday on purpose. They chose that day, Adolf Hitler's birthday, to bring all their guns and bombs to school. They planned this for months, to do this on Hitler's birthday. Um, Kleibold wore a shirt that said serial killer. They shot Isaiah Scholes just because he was black. Remember uh, The Origin of Species by Means of uh, Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races? Nazism, of course, was, we'll get into more of that later, how it's evolution is the foundation for racism. One race must be superior to the rest. Eric's t shirt said natural selection. Darwin's read wrath, according to Rocky Mountain News. Where are these kids getting this philosophy anyway? They spoke German to each other in the hall at school, and Harris wore a German Nazi cross. Now, I'm part German myself, one-fourth German and three-fourths Norwegian. I'm not against I preached in Germany three times. But Hitler was loony. Hitler was a strong believer in evolution, and so were these two boys. So when a bunch of kids get shot in public school, maybe it's time to analyze what we're teaching these kids anyway. Instead of worrying about gun control, let's talk about evolution, because that's the problem. Um, maybe the issue is, should certain criminals be publicly executed? How many people have you seen executed in your life publicly? And, I mean, real, real executions. Probably none, right? Suppose we were raised in the time of Christ in Israel, 
or and did things according to the biblical method, where if a person committed a certain crime, now nobody nobody gets the death penalty unless there are two or three witnesses, according to the Bible. Some of these people will say, well, what if some what if an innocent man is executed? Well, that may happen today, because some people get the death penalty based on circumstantial evidence. You find their blood at the scene, you find their hair at the scene, you know, you put the pieces together, this guy must have done it, and generally they're right, okay, the vast majority of times they, they, after the trial, they're, they're right. But I suppose in a situation like that, you could get an innocent man executed. The Bible says nobody gets executed without two or three witnesses. So I suppose if somebody commits murder and all we have is circumstantial evidence, he should get life in prison. If we have witnesses, he should be executed. That would solve all the problem of these folks whining about what if an innocent man gets executed. But in the Bible, if somebody commits a certain crime, he's publicly executed. That makes a big difference. Suppose you had to take your son downtown to Square, uh, Seville Square, Pensacola, because some rapist is about to be executed publicly, tied up to a stake and shot, or electric chair, or whatever. It doesn't matter how they do it. What kind of impression is that going to make on that kid? On the way home, Daddy, what did that guy do? Well, son, he did, you know, whatever. You know what's going to go through his mind the rest of his life? I don't want to do that. <laughs> right? This guy in France was going to be, have his head cut off, going to put him up in the guillotine, cut his head off. And they're dragging him up the steps, you know, kicking and screaming. And somebody from the crowd hollered out, Do you think this is really going to deter crime? They said, It will for him. <laughs> it certainly will for him, won't it? Yes, capital punishment is a deterrent to crime. It's always a deterrent to crime for that individual. Every time, 100% of the time. And most of the time, it's a deterrent to the rest of the people who see it, too. But we got this dumb idea here in America, three strikes and you're out. Well, what about the victim's families? Now you got three, three families that are, you know, hurting and mourning, and for the rest of their life, their life is destroyed. It ruins things. I mean, if somebody breaks into your house and rapes and murders your wife, you've got to live with this the rest of your life. And there's a relief, there's a satisfaction when you see that guy executed. As long as he's locked up in a jail someplace, you're going to be a nervous wreck. And that's not right. That's not the way God intended it. God intended it for the person who commits certain crimes. I mean, read through the Bible. It's all in there. Certain crimes, the guy's executed. So here we got kids going through school shooting everybody. And the news media jumps on gun control. I think it's time to talk about public executions instead. Okay. Maybe it's time to talk about uh, the subject. Maybe all law-abiding citizens should be required to carry guns. There's a small town in Georgia. They passed an ordinance that says every household must have a gun. Crime rate went to zero. Nobody was robbed. What's that say to the criminals? Everybody in this town has a gun. Well, let's go to a different town. Right? One of the large auto parts chains, I forget, it wasn't AutoZone, but one like that, you know. They passed a, a company policy that said no guns allowed in the store. So they put these signs up on the front door, no guns allowed. You know what that says to a criminal? Easy place to rob. That's what that translates into, doesn't it? I mean, think about it. Wow, nobody here's got a gun. Hmm. Suppose you put a sign up on the front door of your store that says, all employees carry guns. What does that say to a criminal? I mean, think about it, okay? We've gone crazy in this country. Gun control is not the solution. Criminal control is the solution. If, suppose every teacher in that Colorado school had been required to carry a gun. Do you think those kids would have shot everybody? All that would happen, as soon as those kids start blowing up pipe bombs out in, there on, you know, in the cafeteria or whatever and shooting everybody, any kid runs to any classroom. Teacher, teacher, there's a bunch of boys out here shooting everybody. Okay, kids, turn to page 37 and read it. I'll be right back. <laughs> and it's over. Now, I'm not in favor of... I've never shot anybody. I hope I never have to. But I have lots of guns. 
I have a concealed weapon permit. I often am armed. I taught my kids how to shoot guns when they were three years old. My daughter is a really good shot. Pity the guy that messes with her, right? <laughs> now, I, I, she's never shot anybody. I've never shot anybody. I hope I never have to, but I would. I decided while I'm cool, calm, collect, I'm not nervous at all. If somebody breaks into my house to harm my daughter, I'm going to shoot them. As many times as I feel like it. Period. Okay? End of story. That's just the way it is. Now, if you don't like it, well, then don't break into my house. And I won't shoot you. Okay? So, if all law-abiding citizens were required to carry guns, I mean, it's just something to consider. Why doesn't the news media even bring this up as something to discuss? Because some people would like a one-world government, a new world order, where only they are in charge and only they have guns and nobody else has guns. Lenin said, one person with a gun can control a hundred people without one. Watch the movie. The guy comes into the bank. He's got a machine gun. Everybody lay down on the floor. What's everybody do? To lay on the floor. Suppose everybody, just, as, just routine, suppose everybody carried a, a gun. And suppose the bank robber knew most of the people I'm going into this, most of the people in this bank have a gun on them. Law-abiding citizens, they're not going to shoot anybody. They're just going to defend themselves if they need to. Guess how many bank robberies we would have? Very few, right? It's a suicide mission, sure. I got a machine gun. Well, there's 50 people got a pistol. <laughs> One of them's going to blow your head off, you know. It just, it, it works. I mean, it just, common sense, it works, okay? Um, here's the logic they used to justify abortion. They're going to say, well, it's not a human. I'm sorry, that's not true. That's what your book's going to tell you, that it's not a human, it's just a fish. It has gill slits, it's a fish. That was proven wrong in 1874. It's not true, okay? It is a human the instant it's conceived. So that's not good logic to have an abortion. They're going to say, well, it's not viable. That viable means it can live on its own. And they're going to say it's not viable, so it can't live on its own. Well, you're not viable either, stark naked on the North Pole, you know. How long would you live on your own, stark naked on the North Pole? Not too long, right? Just because it's not viable doesn't mean we have the right to kill it. I know kids that are 25 years old that still come home and borrow money from Dad. <laughs> Does that mean we have the right to kill them? Hey, Dad, can I borrow some money? <laughs> you ought to be able to live on your own by now, son. <laughs> Justifiable homicide. I mean, think about this logic. They're going to say, well, the child may be unwanted. Well, there's already kids that are born that are unwanted. Should we kill all of them? My parents moved four times when I was growing up, but I found them every time. <laughs> Just because it's unwanted. I mean, come on. Think about it. They're going to say, well, the child may be a financial burden. Every kid's a financial burden. Show me one that's not. I forget what the numbers is now, are now, but to raise a kid from birth up until about 18 is like $50,000 or something. It's unbelievable what it costs. Oh, they're going to say the child may, may be from rape or incest. Okay, well, that's horrible. But why kill the child? Why not kill the rapist? Mm -hmm. Why do we always have to kill the child? Why don't we abort the mother once in a while? Why do we not even think of these things? A woman's raped. She's pregnant. Okay, kill the baby. Well, no, kill the rapist. See, if you kill the rapist and then adopt out the baby, everybody's happy. That's the best possible situation. If you kill the baby, then the mother, the rest of her life, is going to mourn. There's going to be something in her heart, something in her conscience bothering her. She killed her baby. Now, many good good people have had abortions, and they love God, and it's not the unpardonable sin. And I don't want to make you feel you know, like God can't use you. He can use you. Half the Bible is written by murderers. Moses was a murderer. God used him. King David was an adulterer and a murderer. God used him in a great way. But you, can, you don't want to justify this. Abortion is murder, plain and simple. Um, a doc, I was talking in, in this part of my seminar in a church one time, and this medical doctor was there in the crowd, and he got kind of upset. He said, now, Mr. Hovind, uh, suppose a woman is raped and gets pregnant. Should she be required to carry that baby? I said, well, sir, that's a horrible uh, scenario, but uh, that's a good question. Let me ask you a question. You know, Jesus often answered a question with a question. I said, uh, sir, if a woman is raped and gets pregnant and has the baby... Five years later, 
She's holding her five-year-old, trying to cook supper. The kid's been bad all day. Her mind flashes back to this horrible experience. How did I get this kid anyway? And she loses control for a few minutes, pulls out the steak knife, and <coughs> kills her five-year-old. Is it murder? Of course, right? Okay, what if she would have killed it five months after it was born? Would that have been murder? I said to the doctor, I said, what if she would have killed it five minutes after it was born? Would that be murder? He got real quiet. He could see where I was going. I said, what if she killed it five minutes before it was born? Would that be murder? Yep. Rape's horrible. The rapist ought to be executed, not the child. We're killing the wrong one. Okay, we got it all scrambled up. I, if they say we want free, you know, pro-choice, pro-choice. Okay, let's really choose. Let's pass a law in Florida. You can do this in every state. If a woman goes to have an abortion, the nurse will have a jar full of marbles. We're going to have a lottery. This will be fair, okay? We're going to put one marble in there that says baby, one that says mother, and one that says father. We will pick a marble to see who dies. Let's put one more in there for doctor, and another one for governor, and put several in there for president, okay? <laughs> How many abortions would we have then? Zero. Did you know every politician, without exception, every politician that voted for abortion has already been born? Think about that. Every politician has already been born. Let's let the unborn children vote. What do you think, what do you think they'll say about abortion? Um, they're going to say, well, abortion's legal. That doesn't mean it's right. Just because something is legal doesn't illegal in man's eyes doesn't mean it's legal and right in God's eyes. You know, in 1936, the German Supreme Court declared Jews living in Germany are not persons. If you live in Germany and you're Jewish, I'm sorry, you're subhuman. You're not a person. Well, guess what that says? If you kill one, you didn't kill a person, did you? You can't be tried for murder, can you? Because it wasn't a person. So when Hitler's guards were killing the Jews, it was not murder by, Jew, by German law. Perfectly legal in German law to kill the Jews. After all, they're not human. I've been to Germany three times. Fires me up every time I go there. I read lots of books about Hitler and the Holocaust just to keep my blood boiling. Uh, it was murder. Millions murdered. Why? Hitler thought the Germans were the superior race that deserved to rule the world. You know why he thought that? He believed in evolution. He thought, if one race is superior, it must be me, you know, obviously. And therefore, if we can eliminate these inferiors, that'll speed up the evolutionary process. It'll help the world out. He thought he was doing the world a favor. Um, Sir Arthur Keith, who wrote the foreword to Darwin's book when it was republished in 1959, he was, a, he was an evolutionist. Arthur Keith was uh, greatly honored, and they asked him, because of his uh, scientific ability, we want you to write the foreword to the book. So Arthur Keith wrote the foreword to the 1959 edition. I don't know if this is the one I have here or not. I should have looked. Uh, Editor's introduction, I'll look later on that. But Arthur Keith said, The German Fuhrer has consistently sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. What's that mean? Evolution says one race is superior. I mean, that's what Darwin's book said. So uh, let's find the superior race, eliminate the inferiors, and it speeds up the process. He wanted to develop a super race. Here's Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. I've got it in my library. I've read about half of it. I'm not quite done yet. It's full of his racist philosophy. He said in Mein Kampf on page 216, no more, does, no more than nature desires the mating of weaker with stronger individuals, even less does she desire the blending of a higher with a lower race. Who's a higher race, Adolf? Since if she did, her whole work of higher breeding over perhaps hundreds of thousands of years, this guy believed in evolution, might be ruined with one blow. Historical evidence offers countless proofs of this. It shows with terrifying clarity that in every mingling of Aryan blood with that of lower peoples, 
The result was the end of the cultured people. Who's an Aryan? Hitler, in this book, which I've got in the library there, while six million died, Hitler said uh, he was trying to make people realize the Jews are inferior. He said in a speech, I can only hope and expect that the other world, which has such deep sympathy for these criminals, notice he called the Jews criminals. You know what their crime was? Breathing air that belonged to Germans. Eating food that belonged to Germans. Taking up space that belonged to Germans. After all, they're inferior. They're taking up our space, eating our food, breathing our air. That's why he thought they were criminals. He said, I hope that if you have sympathy for these criminals, we'll at least be generous enough to convert this sympathy into practical aid. We, on our part, are ready to put all these criminals at the disposal of these countries, for all I care, even on luxury ships. Hitler said, you want the Jews? I'll send them to you. Roosevelt refused to take them. In 1938... In the late 30s, if you can get the immigration quotas in America, how many people can come from this country to America? How many can come? From, you know, they had quotas. How many we allowed? Only so many thousand can come from you know this country, and only so many thousand from this country. Called an immigration quota. Go back and look at the quotas from the 1930s. You have blonde hair, blue eyed, coming from Germany. Hey, come on in. Coming from Norway. Hey, come on in. Ireland. Hey, come on in. Jewish. Uh, no, sorry. Only a few thousand Jews were allowed to immigrate into America per year. Hitler said, you can leave Germany, but only take four dollars with you. Roosevelt said, you can come to America, but you've got to have ten thousand dollars. Well, that makes a little bit of a problem, doesn't it? <laughs> you couldn't come to America if you're Jewish unless you had, I think it was ten thousand dollars. They wanted to make sure you weren't going to come in and become part of the welfare situation here. Well, if Hitler says you can leave but only take $4, and America says you can come but only, only you've got to have 10000 that's a little problem to raise $10,000 in one little short trip across the ocean, don't you think? That's how they stopped them from coming in. One boatload of Jews came to Havana, Cuba. This was before they were communist. Sat in the port in Havana and begged, would you please let us get off the boat? They're going to kill us back in Germany. Havana officials, here their relatives are right there watching them on the boat. The relatives on shore, please let them off. No, nope. Havana says, no, nope, you can't come here. They sailed up to Miami. I think there were 916, if I believe the number, something like that. They said, can we please come to America? Miami officials turned the boat away. No, nope, you, cannot, you cannot get off. They sailed all up the east coast of America, stopping at every major port, begging for asylum, and were turned away. They went back to Europe. I don't know what happened to them. America was racist. Roosevelt refused to allow him to come in. Here's Hitler's hit list. Hitler thought the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegians, the Nordic, were close to pure Aryan, the superior race. Did you catch all that? Blonde hair, blue-eyed, Norwegian, born in the daily dog, the superior race. He thought the Germans, the brown-haired, blue-eyed, or less desirable brown-eyed, were predominantly Aryan. He thought the Mediterraneans are slightly Aryan. The Slavics... Yugoslavia, you know, Ukraine. Would you be considered Slavic in the Slavic nation? Yeah. He said they're half Aryan, half ape. He said the Orientals are slightly ape. And the black Africans are mostly ape. And the Jews are close to pure ape. That's why Hitler killed the Jews. Because of his belief in evolution. If he would have killed all the Jews, guess who would have been next? <laughs> black Africans. Hitler hated black people. He thought they were an inferior species. Um, anybody know where the Olympics were held in 1936? In Germany. in Germany. Guess who won the most gold medals? Jesse Owens, the black American athlete. Hitler walked out of the stadium and said, it is unfair to make my men race against this animal. Just because he's black. Hitler was a strong believer in evolution. Acts chapter 17 tells us God made all nations of one blood. See, according to the creation view, we all came from Adam and Eve. Then later, we all came from Noah's three sons. So there's certainly no reason to be a racist and say, I'm superior to somebody else because of the color of my skin or because of the language that I speak. That's just flat silly. Okay, we all came from one blood. Last time I was in uh, Germany, I went to Nuremberg where the trials were held. After World War II was over, 
they got these, you know, German war criminals and had a trial. I was in the courtroom right there. You know what those, I wasn't there when it happened, obviously. Those guys in there, in that trial, they said, we were only following orders. We did nothing illegal. They're, they're correct on both counts. They were following orders, and at the time, it was not illegal by German law to kill Jews. Perfectly legal. They were still convicted of murder, weren't they? See, there's a higher law than German law. God's law. And there's a higher law than U.S. law. God's law. In 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court declared the word person, as used in the 14th Amendment, does not include the unborn. Guess what that means? Exactly what Hitler did in Germany. You're saying the unborn child is not a person, therefore it's not murder. Now, if you, if you find the egg of an eagle, an endangered species, and you take the egg out of the nest and destroy it, you can go to jail for a long time. But if you kill the unborn child and the mother, you don't go to jail. It is so crazy. There have been cases where a pregnant woman gets kicked by somebody, the baby dies, the guy is fined or sued or jailed for killing the unborn child. Well, let's get it straight. How our Supreme Court can be so dumb, I don't understand. It's a child the instant it's conceived. I'm sorry, that's just logical. You know, in the civil, I mean, in the Revolutionary War in America, only 25,000 Americans died. 400,000 died in World War II. 38 million have now died in America by abortion. That's the whole state of California. 1,000 million, that's a billion, have been killed worldwide. Um, each woman around the world now averages one induced abortion in her lifetime, according to Scientific American this year. One abortion per woman. Well, now, hold on a minute. I heard that the, in the Soviet Union, the average is seven per woman. In China, it's in mandatory. You have, you're allowed one child. After that, you get pregnant again, let's go for an abortion. No questions asked. And in China, if you have a son, it's much more preferable to having a daughter. So now they're having just an enormous number of sons born and very few girls. They're going to have one restless population in about 10, 15 years over there. <laughs> Figure it out, okay? Hey, if he's not alive, why is he growing? If he's not a human being, what kind of being is he anyway? The Bible says, Cursed be he that take a reward to slay an innocent person. And all the people shall say, Amen. And abortion is murder. I'm sorry. Six things the Lord hates. One is hands that shed innocent blood. Anybody involved in the abortion industry? God is angry. Margaret Sanger started a group called Planned Parenthood back in 1916. She thought one of her goals was to eliminate the inferior races. She thought Orientals, Jews, and blacks were inferior. She called them human weeds. We need to pull these weeds out of the garden to let the pretty races, you know, the blonde hair, blue eyed Aryans, you know, the desirable races succeed. Same philosophy as Adolf Hitler. Margaret Sanger said in her book, uh, the most merciful thing a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. Their motto of their magazine, The Woman Rebel, was no gods and no masters. Birth control was used to create a race of thoroughbreds, according to her magazine in 1921. One of Hitler's doctors wrote an article for her magazine in 1933. Eugenic sterilization and urgent need. Eugenics is, this, is race control, where, let's say, if somebody is mentally retarded, they should be forced to be sterilized so they can't have any more children that are mentally retarded. If someone has a certain disease, they should be sterilized so they can't have any more children. That's what, that's what he was arguing in this article, we should do this. And Hitler did that in Germany. Certain people were mandatory sterilization. Hitler referred to the Jews as a parasite in the body of nations. You read the literature today from the uh, pro-choice crowd, and they refer to the woman's unborn baby as a parasite in the woman's body. Interesting rhetoric, huh? 
One of their goals was to exterminate the Negro population. But she said in a letter, she said, we don't want the word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. We don't want them to find out about this. But that's one of their goals, was racism. Today they have a Negro president. She got the Humanist of the Year Award in 1986, Faye Waddleton. This document came out, we've got to quit after this. This document came out in 1952. Planned Parenthood document. Now look at this. How to plan your children. Your questions answered. What is birth control? Is it an operation? They said, no, it's not an operation. Is it an abortion? Look what they said in 52. Definitely not. An abortion requires an operation. It kills the life of a baby after it has begun. It is dangerous to your life and health. It may make you sterile. Well, they've, they've changed their tune in 40 years, haven't they? Now, 300 million of your tax dollars goes to support Planned Parenthood. Killing babies all over the world. Okay, next class, we'll take up some more lies in the textbook. And then eventually, hopefully, get to the point of what you can do about it. They got lies in your books. You're going to learn them starting this week. What should you do about it? We'll cover that later on. Join us next week.